is about preparing for the interview. And this is for those who do uh, user interviews uh, for research. And, um, and I put this meme up here because I like the office. And um, he says, uh, am I ready for this interview? False. The question is, is the interview ready for me? And this is, this is the confidence level that I want you to, to feel when we get done, okay? So y'all have to let me know. Uh, so today we're gonna uh, go over the agenda and uh, I'm gonna discuss uh, what, why, and when of user experience research. Um, user interviews are a part of uh, user experience research. So we need to understand where it fits within research and, um, and just kind of give an overview of that for those who are not real familiar with that process. And we're also going to briefly talk, talk about the five steps of research and some common methods. And the reason I wanted to share with some common methods is because we'll hear a lot of different things and, and, um, and they get overlapped and we don't, I want to explain what interviews are and what they aren't. So I just wanted to get you familiar with a few of those uh, terms so you'll understand um, how it's different, how interviews are different than the other methods. Um, and then we're gonna dive deep into the interviews themselves. Um, what are interviews, um, what they're not, um, why we need to use interviews. Um, setting the goals of your questions um, and what you're wanting to learn whenever you're talking to someone. Um, preparing your introduction. It's really important that you set the stage before you start questions. And then um, writing out your questions. And I'll give you some examples of what not to do and what to do. And then we'll talk about some best practices and um, just to, some, some key uh, takeaways. And then we'll uh, do a brief review of how once you gather all this data, um, then what do you do with it and how do you analyze it to, uh, to get the information. And then I'm gonna share some resources with you that I find very helpful and um, hopefully you can dive deeper into some of these things that um, you're interested about, okay? So um, Andre's asking if the slides are gonna be available. Yes, we're gonna make the slides available as well as the, um, the we're, we're recording all of this. So we're gonna share that with everyone. Um, all right, so uh, just to, an overview of what is user research. So it's a systematic investigation, and I'll stop right there because I don't want to just bombard you with word salad. Um, so systematic is speaking about the process. There is a process set up that we're using that um, helps keep things focused. And then we're investigating, uh, which, you know, we're, we're diving deep into uh, the why. So it's a systematic investigation of the user engagement to inform the design and development of a process, service, or product. So um, that's what user research is. So whatever um, method and technique, we can do this for various techniques and methods to capture the needs, behaviors, attitudes, and pain points of the users. And there are over a hundred of techniques and and methods. I have one book that has a hundred of them. Um, so depending on what you decide which way you want to go, you can you can capture different things at different times of the, uh, the process. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, why do we need re user research? Um, we're using research to gather data and analyze it and then share it with those who need to make informed decisions. This is backing up um, assumptions, you know, we can all make assumptions about what the user needs, but I would rather make an informed decision. You know, I have data that backs up that they don't need this, they do need that. So um, it helps in that way, it's, it, you know, gives you better success rate, um, helps you uh, understand the problem. It also gives context to what the users need. Um, if you uh, say they need it because um, they always do this uh, every Monday morning. They need to know this information, so that's why we need to put this on the dashboard. So it gives them context of why it needs to be there. Um, it also helps you find problems, uh, challenges, patterns, commonalities for, uh, throughout the users, and mental models. And mental models is a very fascinating subject, and I do want to encourage you to check out the book by Indy Young. Um, 
I N D I Young. And uh, if you want to learn more about mental models, it's fascinating. I promise you'll, you'll learn something. Um, so what is user research? And this is just a diagram to kind of show where user research is in the process. So we have um, business requirements uh, in the discovery phase. We have to talk to the stakeholders. We have to talk to the business needs to see what they need. And then we dive into the user research. It's under discovery because we're discovering what the users need. And um, I think that was in the video before of you know, user experience uh, is the, the bridge between business needs and user needs. And so in order to do that, we have to find out what they both are. So user uh, research is at the end, is, is in the discovery process. And then this informs the next process, which is the ideation and um, the design. And then once the design is done, we say, okay, we think we understood what we're, what we're doing and we've made this concept so now we're going to validate it and make sure it's true and that we didn't miss anything or that you know it's going to work before we start building it um, so it can help save a lot of money and a lot of time so then um, the reason why we use user research again is to validate assumptions we save time and money we minimize the rework um, we save the reputation of the brand. Uh, you don't want to be sending out things that aren't that aren't working and having to redo everything. It's just a waste. So um, you certainly want things to be successful. Um, and it gives facts and data to the decision makers, and it gives context to concepts, as I said, and then increases your success. And it should be an ongoing process and with the different methods throughout the whole design process. So um, there's no um, bad time for user research. Um, so just to give an overview of the five um, the five uh, steps of user research is uh, the objectives. So we want to know what the objectives of the product is, what the project, uh, you know, what, what are we trying to do? What problem are we trying to solve? Are we solving the right problem? So we need to make sure we have it, you know, documented what the problem is, uh, what, the, what we're trying to do. Uh, what we're trying to solve. Then we need to make some hypothesis about what that problem, uh, what the problem that we're solving, if we do this method, then it should fix this. It should make sure that if we put this um, product here, this feature here, then it should save them some time. Um, and if it doesn't, then we can assume the good, we can assume the bad, and just kind of think through those things so that you can have an idea of what questions you want to ask. And then we pick our method. And in this case, we're picking the interview method. And then, um, oh, sorry. And then um, we conduct the research. We do the actual uh, user interviews and, and capture the information. And then we synthesize it. I keep moving, sorry. Um, it, uh, then we synthesize it or analyze the information so that we can uh, put it all together and report it to the people who need to know. So some common methods of user research, and this is why, uh, this is because, um, like I said before, I want you to um, know that uh, this is what some of the interviews, what we're going to teach about interviews, but then, um, sorry, I'm going to show you what it's not. So. We've heard of focus groups. So focus groups um, are good if you want to get a first impression from someone. Um, you can hear a lot about these on TV commercials and things like that, but um, there's good and, and bad. There's risk for that as well. Um, but a focus group is not an interview. It's just a, a group of people that you're sharing information and getting first impressions from. Uh, usability test. This is more focused on the task and your um, working on specific things that they're, you know, steps and user flows of what they're, what they're doing. Um, observation is um, time and motion studies that's used for those kind of things, uh, just to see what they're actually doing. Um, I've heard an example of a, uh, a man who uh, was asked when he uh, was interviewed, he was asked, how much time do you spend on your computer a day? And he estimated about four hours. Well, then when they actually did a time and motion study, they found that it was 30 minutes. So that's a big difference. And it was seemed like it, but it was just little bits at a time on and off. 
Um, so it was his perception that's a little bit different than the observation. So, and then we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and then uh, surveys, their validation of other data. You've uh, had surveys. We had one as you come in. Um, you should have seen one. Um, but we are, we're trying to validate some information and we get some quantitative data. You know, we're counting how many people chose something. And then A-B testing. I'm sure you've all seen A-B testing. It's a preference of two choices. It could be as simple as a subject line on, a, on an email or, um, you know, a taste test or a blue button versus an orange button. Which one is better? So uh, which one, you know, engages the user? So now we're going to talk about the interviews. So this is the, the meat of the presentation here. So um, we're going to talk about what is an interview. Um, they are one-on-one -on -one conversations with another person. Um, this is self-reporting data, and it can be face-to-face -face or a shared screen. It is not an interrogation. You shouldn't be asking a whole bunch of questions about what they're doing and why they do it and, and that sort of thing in an interrogation way. Um, this uh, takes time, take time to, to connect with the person, to emotionally connect with them because you're trying to get them to trust you with the information. They're about to be vulnerable to you and you want to make sure that they trust you with that information. So, um, it's a conversation with another human being and you just have to keep that in mind um, when, you're, when you're doing interviews. Um, the user is the expert. Um, again, you have to be really humble, um, no ego. You have to humble yourself to them. They are the expert at that moment. Um, it's self-reporting perspective from one person. So in that person's eyes, their perception is reality. So you have to keep that in mind when you're, when you're talking to someone and you're asking them questions. If they say something then you think it's just weird or whatever, just bite your tongue, sit on your hands, whatever you need to do, you cannot, it, it, their, real, their reality. Um, you can include another note taker um, or an observer in an interview, um, but you need to make sure that uh, that person is not going to, influence them. So if you're letting their boss, for instance, listen in, that might change their answers. Um, be careful about who you let in there. If it's another person on your, you know, research team or the designer, that's great. And it's great to bring along those people or even the project manager or the business analyst or somebody to listen in so they can get firsthand account of what the, they're saying. But you need to make sure you disclose that to the to the user and be transparent and just keep the conversation between you and them and the other person should just be note taking and not um, and, and not be asking questions as well because then it becomes a panel and they feel interrogated again it's not an interrogation um, and again see it's a judgment-free zone um, they they have to give you top context for a reason and um, and that they are the expert and you're there to learn from them and do not um, try to really hard. It's, it's hard to do. I promise you. It's really hard to like, somebody's like, really, is that right? Wow. You know, it's like, but you want to empathize with them and you want to like, that's interesting or something like that, but you don't want to just, um, you know, going, Oh, <gasps> you have to care, be careful of your reactions. So you don't want them to feel judged. You don't want them to feel like they've said anything wrong and ever. So they're the expert. Um, okay. So why do we use this interview method? Uh, this interview method is called, uh, is a qualitative data. So qualitative speaks to the quality. And um, this is about motives, excuse me, motives, feelings um, about their experience and their point of view. You're looking for abstract information like attitude, confidence, trust, frustration. And these are the whys of why people do things. And you want to understand that because we can say all day that people aren't using it. They're not using this widget. Well, why? Well, this tells you why. So this is a big reason why we use the interview method. And it sets realistic expectation, expectations for the designs. Are they really going to adopt it? Or are they really going to accept it? 
um, if they're not used to that or they, they have a frustration or, um, you know, they have a bad attitude towards it or they don't have confidence in the numbers, those kind of things, they're not, that may not be realistic for them to use it. No matter how much work you put behind it, they may not use it if they're not confident with it. Um, the users are the experts. Um, this is, you know, saying earlier, this is not for the business team. This is not for the developers. It's not for the designers. This is just for the users. Um, and so they need to have a say in how it's designed. And if it's not going to work for them, it's not going to work for anyone. And they're not going to meet any goals. So um, we also need to make sure that the design is in alignment with, um, with the users um, as well as the business needs. Is it feasible? Is it helpful? Is it useful? Um, those are the, some of the basic user experience uh, goals. And we want to make sure that they line up. And if they, we find out from the user that they're not, then, um, you know, we got to go back to the drawing board to start over. So um, let's set some goals so we can um, kind of go through the process here. So in order to uh, set up an uh, interview with the user, you need to understand what you're trying to learn. And there's time, their time is valuable and you want to make sure that you get as rich information as possible. You don't want to uh, waste your time and have to keep going back to something. So really think out what you're doing. And to do that, we need to set our goals. Um, we need to do that because um, we need to make sure what does the business need in order for this to be successful. If we're going to design this thing, this, you know, uh, this new feature, um, what, or what is success to the business? Um, what is the design? Does the design align the way um, the job is being done now or should be done in the future? So um, like right now, we're doing some digital transformation at my job and people are learning one way and it's way different than what they're, they're used to learning. And there's a bit of a, a curve and we're having to do some change management on that because, you know, people develop habits. And so we need to make sure that it, that they are carried over. So, um, and what do you hope to learn from these interviews? I w you want to make sure that you, you know, I want to know for sure how they feel about it, if they're confident in it. Um, you know, there may be a bunch of different other things that the business wants to know. Ask them how they handle this problem um, so that we can address that and maybe prioritize our issues. So it's really helpful to think about setting the goals for the interview. And it also helps you establish your target audience that needs to be tested. Um, are we asking the right people? Um, we need to make sure that the people that you're talking to are actually the ones that are going to be using this the most and get the most value out of it. And it helps you decide a location. Um, you know, we're so lucky these days to have the ability to, to do remote testing and, um, and talk to people online as we're doing now. And, um, but sometimes there's certain things you can't do that way. You know, software is easy to do online, but sometimes you need to go there and actually uh, observe them and which location would be the best for that, you know, to, to get the information, so. So let's set some goals and um, we're going to say just for, for the sake of, of, you know, having, having something to, to grab onto here. Um, this is an example of how we can um, align the different goals. So we're going to say the business goal says, I want to say 15 minutes per day um, for my hundred employees. So that's 1500 minutes a day. And 1,500 minutes equals 25 hours, and people make $15 an hour. So, um, so that's $375 um, a day, and um, so we've got 240 days. I just, you know, use some of the working days, not as holidays, weekends, that sort of thing. Came up with we got to save $90,000 a year. I know the math may not be right, but where <laughs> anyway, it's just an example of what they've given you. So you've got $90,000 that you need to save. And so how does a designer look at that and say, how do I save them time? Well, the designer can say, I can make these concepts that saves the user steps and time and confusion and puts everything that they need, where they need it, when they need it, that sort of thing to save them some time, but we need to make sure that it saves them up to 15 minutes a day. And um, uh, did I miss anything? 
that I put something in there that's not needed, that sort of thing. So that's what they're, you know, this is my interview goal. This is, I'm trying to figure out what, what I'm going to do here. And then on the user, we can make assumptions. Again, when we're doing our hypothesis, we're assuming that the user is going to think, does the new functionality help me do my job more efficiently with less frustration? You know, the user's like, I don't want to be frustrated. I just want to make it smooth and easy to do. Okay. So now the next step, you can't just go right in and start asking questions. You need to introduce yourself. And I use awesome powers because I, a fan. So this is really awkward. It's an awkward introduction. So you want to plan your, your introduction. So prepare it. Um, you need to introduce yourself. There's a few things you need to cover. Give the reason why you're doing the interview. Set their expectations. Um, get permission to record it. Um, give them a chance to ask any questions. So it kind of sets the stage and um, and gets them in that, okay, this is the way we're about to, this is about to happen. So, um, so here's an introduction example um, that I've used uh, many times. Uh, I'm, I'm Sherry Pitts. I'm the user experience researcher. I'm not the designer. I'm not the developer. So I'm telling them, you know, I'm totally neutral with this. Uh, anything you share with me today is not going to hurt my feelings. It's not going to be complimentary to me. So, I'm simply going to capture your answers and share them with the team, but I'm not going to associate your name with any of your answers. Um, so everything you say to me will be confidential and not shared with anyone but the user experience team. The purpose of this interview is to review the new concepts that's been designed to save you some steps in your daily tasks. The team needs to know if they're realistic to your needs to do your job successfully. So it's just kind of laying it out there with the purpose. There's no right or wrong answers, and you are the expert. Please correct me if I have any incorrect statements or assumptions, and I'm here to capture information from you. So this sets it up again where you are the humble note taker, and you are just trying to get information from them, and they, they have, you know, now they have the perception that they're the, the expert, which they are. So then I ask, is it okay uh, to have your permission to record for my reference? And we usually get a verbal as, as well as a written, um, just to cover yourself, uh, so you can have the documentation that you did get it. And then I say, do you have any questions for me? And usually they don't, but some of them may have. So um, I also wanted to say that I often send a brief what to expect email and an invitation uh, with this information in it. Um, to the interviewer, you know, with, when I put it on their calendar. Um, but I also go over it verbally with them as well, just to reiterate what we're doing. Um, so now we are looking at the uh, writing the, the interview questions. So uh, we're going to prepare the questions ahead of time. So this um, allows you to structure the questions in a meaningful way. You don't want to just randomly put them um, in there and then go back. So you want to look at what you're testing. If I'm testing something that takes someone through a user flow, you want to make sure the questions are um, uh, in that order. Or are you uh, asking them about something specific? Um, you can talk to them first to get them start, get used to answering questions. I know it's kind of got to get them in the mindset. So you want to ask them easy questions like, what's your title? What's your role here? How many, experience, how many years experience do you have? How long have you been in this position? You may need their age or previous background information, whatever demographics that you need to be able to share the, the reporting information. And then you can start diving it into more specific uh, questions um, about the task or the, you know, the details that, that you're needing to know. Um, it allows you to reword them and remove assumptions and biases. You can re read a question and go, wow, that's really leading. I didn't even realize, you know. And so it allows you to, to work through them, uh, work through the mess a little bit and clean them up and, and ask only what you need to ask. Um, it allows you to make sure it aligns with the goals that we, that we made earlier. You know, is this going to um, meet the design goals? Is this going to meet the, the business goals? Uh, 
So, and then it allows you to create the method of analyzing your answers in a structured way. Once I get this information, what am I going to do with it? And uh, you can go ahead and get that set up so that you can have a quicker turnaround. You know what to do and where to plug it in. Um, and then you know how to get the you know, information out because the, the information is no good unless you can report it clearly. So, and it also allows you to include any follow-up questions. Um, by that, I mean, if someone, you know, says yes to this, then I want to ask additional questions if they say yes. If they say no, then we'll just move to the next question. Okay, so now we are um, writing the interview questions. We're going to ask open-ended, non-leading questions. I'm going to say that again. Ask open-ended, non-leading questions. And I'm going to give you some examples, but I want to tell you what, um, what this means uh, a little more. And then the next slide is the question. So closed questions require specific answers, like yes or no. A one or a zero. It's this or that. There's no uh, feelings in it. There's no, it's just, it is. Um, leading questions implies that there's a correct or incorrect answer. And some people may not realize that they're asking leading questions until uh, they write it out and they see, wow. Um, okay. And then you have closed or leading questions can give you false positives, like they really liked it. Well, if you said, do you really like this? And they said, yes, they may be, you know, subconsciously trying to please you. So um, people do that. It's just the human nature and you don't want to do that. Um, and then um, not using open-ended questions can give assumptions that are not true. Um, so uh, it gives you false data. So it's not any good. So now we're going to talk about the examples. This is the, the meat that everybody's waiting on, right? So closed, ended, and leading questions. Here's some examples. Did you like, do you like this design? It's kind of a loaded question. And it, it, it makes them, you know, feel bad if they go, no. So, well, yeah, it's okay. You know, it's not going to be uh, positive or negative uh, or give you information. Do you think this is a good start on this design? Well, how do they know? You know, it's just their um, their perception, and it's kind of uh, requiring speculation. And then, would would you use this in the future? Again, it's implying uh, speculation for them to say, and and they don't know. And how much time will this save you? How are they supposed to know that? Um, you know, yeah, it would save a lot of time. Well there's not a measurement for that, right? So these are kind of, to me, useless questions, and they're not going to get you the information that you want. What we really need to do is give open-ended questions, and that can give you cleaner data. So instead of, do you like this design, what is your first impression? So if you say, what is your first impression of something? There's no right or wrong, good or bad, anything. They just have to start telling you their thoughts, right? And then can you tell me if anything is missing? Remember we set those goals earlier. We we're talking about if the, the designer wanted to know if they were missing anything. Can you tell me if there's anything not necessary? So um, if I have something on here that's not even needed, I don't even know what that is. I've never seen that before. Don't know what, what I would use it for, you know? Um, and they identify that. And then how would you describe your confidence level in this concept? Um, that can give you, you know, their, their confidence level. So you can pass that on. It's like they really felt good about it. They said, no, I don't know. I'm about, a, you know, three out of five. So it's, um, it's really important that you use these types of questions, um, open-ended, and you see the difference. Um, I'm sure you can uh, now that it's been explained a little bit more. So then I wanted to go over some best practices, excuse me, um, that you definitely want to do whenever you're giving interviews. So you want to record it. I promise you, you will forget. There, you will get things mixed up. You will, um, uh, it, it's just really difficult to, to remember your, 
the biggest lie we tell ourselves is I'll remember this. And there's times where I've, I've had five interviews in a week and I've gone back and listened to the first one because I'm starting to do the analyzing and I don't even remember the conversation. So make sure that you record it. You have to, to make sure you record it in some way. At the very least, take notes, but you need to, to uh, get an audio recording and at best, the screen recording or video, okay? Um, you have to make your interviewee feel heard and understood. And if you're in person, you can do that by looking to, at them directly, lean forward, make them feel heard, ask more open-ended questions. And if they say something and you need some more information on it, you can say, wait, can you tell me more about that? Or can you explain further and just keep it open so that they'll dig a little bit deeper and, and share um, more information with you. And they, they know that you're listening and they know that they're, they're being understood. Um, so then if you're also, you know, you have to do the screen share. So um, you can't do those things. You can't lean forward and you can't, you know, look at them directly. Uh, as, as well as you could in person, but you can use active list, listening techniques. And um, I'm sure some of you have heard this, but it's, you know, so what I'm hearing is, and you repeat back in your words what they just told you, um, and, and make sure, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, say, is that correct? Is that what you're saying? If not, correct me. So that puts them in the driver's seat. They're in control of the information that you're capturing. Um, and then uh, take your time. Don't rush them. Don't rush them through this because um, it makes them feel, you know, that it, you have better things to do, that you, they should be the focus. Don't predict the future. If this happened in the future, what would you do? Nobody can answer that. Uh, avoid double barreled questions like, tell me about the problem, then how you handled it. Those are two different things. First of all, it's confusing to them about how much information you want for both. And then it's also difficult to capture if they're all mixed together. Um, and don't assume they understand the jargon. If you're saying, oh, when this user flow or this uh, if using UX um, jargon or business jargon, uh, try to find out what they're saying and use their terms so that you're talking about the same thing. You need to use the same language. Um, and then wrap up strong. And by that, I mean, thank you so much for, you know, list, you know, spending your time with me and sharing this information. Talk a little casually with them. This is really, really helpful and give them a chance to add anything and talk a little bit more about something, use some follow-up questions. Um, and then thank them for their valuable time. And um, they've spent their moments with you to make the product better. So it's really important and valuable that they feel appreciated when you finish. And now I'm going to talk about what you do when you get these answers. So um, this is uh, an assessment analysis, um, just a very quick layout um, to, to go over quickly. Um, this is the, um, sorry, the the demographic information that I, I said to talk to them first about, this is, you know, the user and you can do A through B, C, whatever, if you're sharing it with other people, but you can have their names there in your version and then their job title keeps doing that. Sorry. Um, and the job title is the demographic information. Like I spoke to three salespeople and two accounting people and five, you know, uh, traffic managers or something. So you have the the mix of your users there. So you, they know who you're talked to. Um, and then you said, this is what their answers were. The first impression um, was, here's all the answers. And then you look at all those answers and find the keywords and pull the theme from it. And it may be all good, bad, maybe mixed. Um, and then you do that with each question. Are they missing anything? These could be all different. That means if, there, if you get different answers for lots of things, then you need to do more, uh, more data gathering. <laughs> um, but if it starts to, to overlap and start, um, you start getting like five of the same, then, then you're okay. Um, that's a whole different story. 
a um, whole different uh, presentation. And then uh, the same with the other questions. And then at the end, once you get done with all this, then you'll see the theme that's coming out. And then uh, you can make a recommendation to either move forward with the design, like it's, it was favorably received, it looks like you're not missing anything, or you can do it, rework all of it, rework some of it, rework just this area. And, uh, or you need to validate further because there's a lot of mixed information. There's a whole lot of here that we, we need to, uh, to find out. So um, with that, um, I will share uh, my resources. Um, I wanted to show you this slide. Uh, NNG group, uh, NN group is amazing. They do certifications and things like that. Um, and then usability.gov, I've used that almost every week of my career since I started doing this. It's got so much valuable information and templates and step-by-step and -step process of things. Um, and then another one, I actually just found this last night. It's called Awkward Silences. It's a podcast. And I wanted to show you the names of the, um, the episodes that they have. And um, there, I want to see, I want to listen to all of them. So um, it's really, really, really helpful. Uh, podcast and they're running from 2018 until February. So there'll probably another one coming out soon that looks like they're doing every two weeks. So um, I do want to encourage you to download that. And um, now uh, I guess we're time for questions. Sorry. Okay. That was amazing, Sherry. Oh, that was super helpful. I'm I'm getting ready to propose a, a user research phase, so it was it was great to hear. Can you give me an example of a double-barreled question? Yeah, the one that I used was the, you know, tell me about the problem and then how you solved it. It's, you know, like, okay, which one do you want to know that or or um, do you do this or that or this or that? You know, just asking several different things just a ask shotgun one. Question yeah sure. yeah just you don't want to um give them more than one thing to focus on at a time try to get them focused i love your uh grid can you go back to the grid slide sure it's deceptively simple so my problem with yeah. these is i come away with a whole lot of different themes uh-huh right it's there's so many themes that it this looks like it would be kind of quick to fill out but <laughs> yeah and I wanted to share this this is um, I was hoping we'd have time this is one that I did this last week um, we had six people interviewed um, from Minnesota and of a new concept and there wasn't even they weren't even asked all the same questions it was just hey tell me about your job and look at this concept what do you think so I had to kind of pull out the themes myself and um, and going through this and listening to all of them, I pulled out, you know, the satisfying part of their job, the pain points. Of course, that's a long one. <laughs> and um, and then highlighted some major things that need to be, you know, addressed and then uncertainty when they're like, I don't know what happens when this ha you know goes to that person. I don't know what happens to it after that. Um, and then if they're having issues with financial or credit department, you know, and then um, the dashboard, if they mentioned, because they're building a dashboard for these people, and that they're like, if I had this on the dashboard, or if I had that, or if I could see that, um, it would be really cool to have a one-stop shop there, that sort of thing. So I just jotted that, those things down. And then when they mentioned the clients, what my clients need, I wanted to make sure I captured that. And then, of course, the tools that they use. They use so many different tools. And they have thoughts and feelings on those as well. <laughs> so I captured all of those and then uh, their new prototype feedback. I mean, that was the purpose of going there was the new prototype, but I captured all this additional data um, along with, you know, um, some, some priorities that they can use if they uh, use this data. So I went ahead and shared that with the team. Um, but yeah, that's how I used it. And, and it doesn't necessarily have to pull the theme, but like you see, I put, um, you know, highlighted in bold, just some things that. Your themes that, are kind uh, of that, that top row, that right, row one, right. right? Right. So I was starting to see a pattern with, with all of them just by listening to the stories. So. Um, do yeah. you type your own transcripts or do you get transcripts done from the recordings? Um, yeah, we, um, 
we send them out to be transcribed. And, and it's really funny because if they don't know the, you know, the vocabulary, it's, it's funny what they come back with. But, um, but yeah, we send that out. That's just too time consuming and I don't have a foot pedal thing and all that. <laughs> right. Do you end with an oh, open-ended yeah. question? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Susan. I was just going to ask one more. Do you end with an open-ended invitation to tell me anything else you think I need to know? Absolutely. I actually say, please reach out to me um, on email or Skype or whatever, you know, method. And uh, if something, because, you know, when you're, you go away from something and go, oh, I wish I would have told them that. And I know that happens to everybody. So I said, if you think of anything that you think I need to share, you need to share with me, just send me an email, send me a message really quick and I will uh, get back to you or I'll add it. Cause it's going to take me a while to, you know, get all this information together and I'll make sure it gets in the, in the information I can add to it. So um, I've only had about two of them reach out and do that, but I always leave that open for sure you want to make sure that that door is open. And I said, even after this project, you know, if, if there's anything else that you feel like needs to be shared, you know, I'm an, I'm, I'm here for you. I'm the researcher. I'm your advocate. So, yeah. Uh, Sherry, I see Paul is asking, what do you mean by themes? Do you want to expound about oh, the themes? Sure. Sure. So um, whenever I uh, was, you know, reading, reading over something as I can, I'll use this again as an example. So um, whenever I'm starting to read something and they say, I'm getting stressed out, I just want to know, make sure things, you know, like if my, my contracts are going to renew and they don't cancel. Okay. Well, that's kind of a negative thing. It's kind of a annoying thing. So I try to say that that that's a pain point. Um, and then if they're like, I don't know, I'm not sure then it's uncertainty. So you just kind of read through and you're, and you start um, trying to figure out what's, what's the main message. What is the message that they're trying to, to tell you? And, and it goes across it, what you're trying to do is synthesize those through all of the interviews, you know, one or two of them, uh, you may not see a theme, but if you, you're looking at six of them, you're definitely going to see a theme. Everybody is saying something about accounting. Somebody has something to say. So um, what are they saying about accounting? Well, they don't know what happens, but they know that this is broken or whatever. So you can pass that information on to them. Even if that's not the purpose of your interview, you can certainly pull that out as additional information. And it makes it really rich that to share in, in various ways. I hope that answered your question, Paula. So it's pattern finding. Yes. Actually. This is where you're finding the patterns across yes. participants. Yes. Because you might have one person who just didn't understand the way it was set up or, you know, mm -hmm. reads, a, reads a sentence wrong or whatever the heck, you know, there's right. always outliers. But what you're looking for is where can we Where's have, the pattern? A, have a finding with a recommendation. Right. Right. And, like, and just like another... everybody thought this spot took too long or, yeah. you know, everybody reports that they have trouble with the accounting department or whatever. Right, and I just did um, a, another study that it was coming across to us, uh, like this person is doesn't trust it because of this. This does, person doesn't trust it because of that. And they were all different. But um, the, the, the theme was they, were, they weren't trusting it. And mm -hmm. why weren't they trusting it? Because what they were seeing was not what they expected. Mm -hmm. why, why are they expecting it that way? because they haven't been told any different. So that tells me we need some change management. You know, it's a higher, higher thing. So, um, and all I was doing was asking them their thoughts about things. So um, it, it's really interesting how you can pull that out. And those individual people don't know, that's not what they were trying to tell me. You know, they don't know that. Um, they weren't specifically saying, we need change management. Nobody's teaching us the right way to do this. They just know that they're confused and frustrated. So thanks for helping me with that. I, I have a question there, Sherry, as well. Um, how, do you, how do you determine and or who to be interviewed? So well, what's the approach to that? Well, I, I work in an enterprise, so I have to go through, um, and my main focus is employees. So I have to go through um, their managers to get approval on who to interview. 
and they would probably know best as well who has the most experience in this area, um, who would be a good person to talk to about this, and they give me a list of names, and then I, um, I try to validate them as much as possible and screen them as much as possible. So um, what I do is um, I look and see if they're using this, you know, using this tool. If they're not, then I'm not going to talk to them. If they are using it, but just for a little, and they're not completely adopting it, then that's a good person to talk to because I can find out why they're not adopting it. Um, so I just try to screen them out. So then even though I've gotten a list of 10 people from the manager, I can whittle it down to about five, you know, uh, and then set up some meetings with them, five or eight or something, and then set up some time with them and, uh, and then talk to them and say, I was given your name by your manager, <laughs> but I know that this is a, um, what we call a B to E situation. And if you are, um, a B to C, like you're working for, um, business to customer, then, um, then you need to have a, a way to recruit and that's a whole different thing. There's lots of tools out there to recruit. There's lots of um, companies that help you do that like usertesting.com and um, uh, you can get, you know, depending on what the type of people that you need and you have a target audience. Most marketing companies um, have a target audience um, that they're trying to reach and you try to find um, someone in that area and sometimes you have to give incentives for that um, but yeah that's a whole different different thing but that's a great question there's a, a whole science in that as well makes me think we should ask Galloway to come talk about recruiting sure user user uh, participant recruiting they they're a company here in town that have those equi well equipped usability labs and they do recruiting for a fee yeah, and like we did, um, I did validately.com for a while, and that way you can catch your, the, the uh, on-screen interview with them, um, and then that lets you uh, do some recruiting, and you can use your own people, or you can um, recruit, and it ch costs like $15 per person. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so. Way too um, we were paying Galloway. Yeah, so. Um, they that's you a don't good have one as much control over who like screening you do have some screening you can put screening questions in like you know their their age and their uh it can i, I think you can do region you can't get it down to like zip code but um you can do region or city um but yeah that's um a whole nother whole nother thing but yeah user testing validately user zoom um and i have never heard of Galloway, but there's lots of companies out there that do that kind of thing. And depending on the type and the method, um, to answer your question, Richard, to further is depending on the method. Um, I know I've done some guerrilla testing, which, you know, gone out in the hallway and say, look at this, what do you think? <laughs> and I try not to do that unless I'm absolutely desperate to get some kind of feedback. But um, yeah, this depends, you get people walking down the street. Right, <laughs> Susan Phillips. Okay, any so other questions? You, yeah, you. Do we have any questions or anyone wants to add some color commentary? Andre. Hey, how y'all doing? Hey. Um, I do have a question. First of all, thank y'all for you know putting this together this way. I really appreciate it. I was actually wondering how we were gonna do it. So thank you, first of all, let me say that. Um, secondly, my question is going to be uh, about user interviews. Do you all know of any resources where maybe there have been any user interviews that have been published, like, you know, like on YouTube or something like that, to where, you know, a person can kind of just get a chance to look at it, like, like, wow, okay, so that's how this, these people are carrying on these user interviews. It may not be relevant to my project per se, but just me being able to see it carried out would be really, really, really awesome to see. Yeah, I believe there are some on YouTube. You could do examples of user experience. Um, again, go to the NN group, um, dot com, and um, they have some examples as well, and can walk you through the process. And and you're you're at iHeart, aren't you? I'm sorry. Are you at iHeart? No, ma'am. Uh -uh. Oh, okay. So, um, 
but yeah, there's a, lots of examples and, and we could even, if I can find some, I can share a bit in the Slack. Oh, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. Now I do have another question if nobody else has a, has a question right now. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, the, another question I had is, okay, she mentioned earlier, she said, you know, there are instances in which remote testing um, is going to be, you know, be more sufficient, you know, than, uh, than in-person testing and vice versa. In general, I'm pretty sure I have my head wrapped around, you know, what some use cases would be, but because you have so much more experience than I do, are there any examples that come off the top of your head with regards to um, remote testing versus in-person in testing? Like, you know, hey, this particular type of thing you're testing should most likely be done in person as opposed to this type of thing we're testing you can pretty much get away with doing remote testing um well i i would say the remote testing is mainly for uh software that mm -hmm. you're using on the computers and you know you can get by with that because um, everything is on the screen anyway and i have done in person but i also sent them something so that I can capture their screen at the same time my computer was sitting on the other side while mm -hmm. I'm sitting there talking to them and it's capturing what we're talking about as well as their screen so um, if I can do it in person you definitely want to but if you can't then the, the very least you can do as software is to to do that but if you're saying you know uh, something about a layout of a store or something, you know, you can't necessarily do that on screen mm -hmm. and it's not going to get the same impact. Um, if you're going to do designing a space, you know, or something, you need to have the full perception. You can take pictures and you can do uh, videos and things like that, but it's not going to be the same as if you're in person and get the perception live, you know? Okay. So that's, that's, uh, that's what I was saying about the difference. Sometimes okay. you can do it in person and it's like observation. Uh, if you're doing observation, time and motion study type thing, that definitely needs to be in person because even if they're doing software, um, I'm sitting behind them or, you know, off to the distance so they can't, I'm not interfering with what they're doing, but I see how many times they swivel their chair, you mm -hmm. know, they go to this software and then they switch to the other one and then they switch back to the other one and then they get a phone call and then they got somebody talking to them on the desk and all that. So that's different. I can't capture that on the screen. You right. Know? So that's giving me the context in which they're using the software. Why did they stop for five minutes? Because they're on the phone and somebody came by and talked to them. So it gives you more con uh, context. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's great. Really. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for the link also, Bob. I appreciate it. Hey, real quick. I think uh, Katie's trying to ask a question. She's not able to unmute herself though. Poor Katie. I, I promoted you, Katie, or did you, were you able to? I think she's a... Katie, you don't even look muted. I think it just moved over for her. Okay. Okay. Katie, are you there? And, and Caitlin, uh, to answer your question, validately, yes, that's correct. You're spelling it correctly. It's actually much cheaper than usertesting.com. <laughs> usertesting.com, they're a bunch of pirates. <laughs> pirates. <laughs> Bob, are you sending me to Pirate Island? <laughs> <laughs> Arr, maybe it's September. What is the date for Talk Like a Pirate Day? It's like September 12th. Or <laughs> we should have a um, Talk Like a Pirate Day theme, UX USA. We totally should. <laughs> should um has everybody voted in the poll oh goodness let me see uh polling okay here we go hey yeah. bob your door just opened all by itself uh-oh he's my my son okay <laughs> Is that the hey, Bob? Is that the ghost of Davy Crockett opening up your? <laughs> <laughs> this is the culprit. My son's dog. He, she just got uh, groomed today, so I can put her on camera. Oh. Aww. We got a little. Uh, so did we? Did we lose Katie? Awkward. So Katie, Katie is the one that's supposed to be doing our door prizes. Oh, she's here, but she can't speak. So that's uh, that's okay. 
Okay. <laughs> Where's the uh, uh, poll at? Is it in the Q&A? It should have popped up on your screen. I cannot speak. Oh, my, I might not see it. Okay. It doesn't show that she's muted. The mic might be on. Oh, she's saying I'm speaking, but you can't hear me. Okay. Yeah, we all do. Go for it, Katie. Okay. So, yes, door prize is time. And the door prize is a $25 gift certificate to Amazon or to Rosenfeld Media, your choice. And Drum roll. we want to know what book you get. Yeah. And give you us a book get... review on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We want you to get a UX book. Okay, Katie. And it comes with a lot of constraints, doesn't it? <laughs> Okay. Let's do the rent. Winner Drum is roll. Michael Verdi. Yay! Right. Awesome. Pretty cool. Congratulations. Oh, there's the poll results. Okay. So Susan's going to take your name, Michael, so we can um, get you a. Oh my God! I'm getting, with a, I'm getting spoiled. I guess. I got some user data <laughs> for you right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So it looks like 25% of our people are new, just starting out. Um, and well, looking 50 for a job. Are new plus starting out, right? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's fully half. That's really cool. And you're needing the meeting so to cover strategy. Seven. Usability research, yeah. All right, great info. It is good info. Thanks for doing that. And we had a good turnout. And, and was there anybody who was not already familiar with Zoom? I wasn't familiar with it. I never used it before. How was it for you, Andre? It's been pretty smooth. I mean, the, uh, the transition of the slides are great. It fills up the screen really good. Um, I got the video camera panels to the right with the, um, with the chat right underneath it. I think it's pretty great. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's really good. I did get it to the, my, my laptop ran out of resources a couple of times. I had to close down Chrome and uh, that was just being a resource hog. But <laughs> the, uh, yeah, good. Oh, pretty great. Paula couldn't figure out how to ask questions. There's a bar, there's several different toolbars, one of which says Q&A, participants Q&A polling, share screen. So just, just before we, we end up, and then we can get a chance if anyone wants to talk, and we can do some networking at the end if people want to chat, stay on and chat. Um, we did, we, I've got to find out the status, uh, AIGA, was planning um, the Incarnate Word uh, chapter, was planning had to have a, a online port a portfolio day uh, in April. Um, I don't know with everything that's going on, whether it's still on, but uh, we they are looking, or they were looking for people to help come out and review portfolios or bring your okay. out and bring your portfolio out and uh, present it. So, um, uh, we'll find out more information. We'll post that definitely on on our Slack channel uh, as we get more information on that. But, uh, awesome. Uh, I met with Alamo Colleges, and they are letting their students have a portfolio tool, and they're keen to help the students understand how important it is for them to be amassing examples for a portfolio. It's just so much more powerful than I don't have any experience, you know. So I would love to invite some of their leadership and students to that, if that's, if that's uh, possible. Hmm. Oh, definitely. Um, do do you have any other announcements that we want to make? Do you, uh, anyone uh, out there, any other announcements before we go to our final and closing inspirational speech story? Maybe. Do you have anything, Sherry or Susan, any, any other announcements? Okay, well, one of the things we wanted to try to do is uh, towards the end or at the end of um, our meetup is to uh, get a, an inspirational story to get us all revved up, amped up to go from this meetup and, uh, you know, do good to the world. 
and we thought no one would be better than Bob uh, Hotard to start this off for us. So, Bob, you have three minutes, and then Susan, you can mute him at that point, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm dead. Is this, is this a pirate story, Bob? I'm down to three minutes and 47 seconds. No. <laughs> so, take it away, Bob. Just kidding. I've got a timer, so uh, I'll, I'll talk to you again. Like my, uh, like my sister says, or my uh, Cajun friend says, well, y'all just have to listen faster. Right. <laughs> so uh, what I'm going to talk to you about is uh, getting over your wow wow moments. Hashtag DOT do one thing. So you all know me and, and my story. Some of you know it too well. But I, I've been in user experience business for like 23 years. I've survived eight mergers, 10 career transitions and counting. Uh, when I started... Uh, at the company I'm with now, it was SBC and lots of mergers. Now it's AT&T Communications, we own Warner Media and Xander Advertising. So I want to tell you a story though that's not part of UX, and I, I may have said this in a couple of times in a couple of different ways, but I really feel it's important. I was working retail way before UX, and I was being considered for advancement. I thought I was doing everything right, and but I just wasn't getting that call or that promotion or the recognition I deserved. And of course, there were all the po politics of management and favorites, et cetera. And I was, you know, I was just distraught. And I went to my friend, Eddie, Eddie DeMary, I'll never forget it. And I said, what do I do? What, what am I not doing? What's, he said, Bob, there's no substitute for being in the store. And I was working retail at the time, so it, you know, it didn't really connect. What are you talking about, Ed? Or we, we actually called him Mr. Ed. And uh, he said, look, just go make a call. On your worst days, at your lowest moments, okay, you might need counseling, but consider that, but just go make a call. It might be a crappy store you're going into. We were at retail, you, you know, grouchy store owners, they might kick you out, but you're moving and you're doing something positive. You're picking up old stock, placing orders, setting up displays, meeting other people. So what does that have to do with UX? Well, think about it for a minute. So one other quick, quick story. There's a famous NFL uh, American football coach that uh, is famous for telling his players something simple on the field during a game. He leaves the sidelines and goes to the, to the bench. He gets all the players around, either the offense or defense, and he doesn't talk strategy or plays or anything. He just says three words, do your job. So here's mine to you, practice your craft. I have to learn sketch, so I force myself to use the tool and get better each day. I have to understand accessibility more this year. So contrast ratios. So I forced myself to use a color contrast analyzer and a dropper on gradient backgrounds. So the text, the white text on blue and light blue, because that's AT&T colors, I have to understand visual design better. This, you're gonna think it's a prop, but it's actually, I keep it on my desk. It's part of my goals for this year. HTML and CSS, I have to learn code now because we're transitioning to React. And by the way, it's like a picture code book. It's very well written. I like it. lots of pictures. P pictures good, words bad. So the, the point is, you, you know, you never, you never stop learning. Your thirst, your quench for knowledge uh, is, is never satisfied. Um, there's always a lot of noise. Use the win strategy. What's important now? What's more fun than what you're doing doesn't really, really matter. Sometimes what you're working on, just one more set of test questions, design, one more code snippet. That's all you need to do for this day in this moment. And I know I'm at three minutes. Because it's not the end of the day, you know, or at the end of the day, it's really not what you accomplish that matters. It's how many days where you string along those days where you've accomplished just that one thing, that one extra thing. How many of those days have you done, have you put together? That's really what makes the difference. It's not a competition. There's always someone better, faster, more talented than you are. You're always going to be better, faster, more talented than someone else. So stop worrying about that and stacking up yourself against someone else and the coronavirus and that's, it's all noise. Just practice your craft. One more portfolio use case, one more flow diagram, one more test question or set of test questions, one more component. Help Bob. One more podcast. Podcast. <laughs> website. Uh, start to build and add to your success story. That's what's important. Final, final comment, shameless plug. Having New Eyes podcast is now on Apple Podcasts, <laughs> Spotify. Episode one, Identity, drops this Tuesday, March 17th. So be looking for that. But episode zero is out right now. You can go to that. Well, what thank you, everyone. And every good to you. Have a great rest of the week.
Yeah, can you, can you to, uh, put the uh, podcast uh, name of it um, in the uh, chat? The chat. So. Yay. Thank Thanks, you, Bob. Bob. Great, great, great words. Uh, Sherry, anything to kind of wrap up? Uh, no, I just wanted to um, thank our sponsors tonight, um, Firecat Studio, Susan, for uh, giving us our, our Zoom, letting us use Zoom, and then uh, Jake for Tech Systems. Um, thanks so much for making this happen, and we really, really appreciate it. And our next meetup, we'll either do a webinar or at iHeart, depending on the level of situation. Right. Um, we'll be creating a scalable design process. So, that sounds great. Yeah. Um, Y'all yeah. asked a question earlier today about whose business are being, you know, impacted. Well, I'm in the wedding industry. Mm. I've been a photographer for 19 years. And uh, yeah, it's some real questions starting to go around. I think today was the first day I've received phone calls from couples asking about Are they canceling your weddings? Is that happening already? Postponements are being talked about. Wow. So, uh, yeah, it's getting to that point. And, uh, and we also offer photo booth services. So, you know, props, you know, people touching them, you know, putting on the face. So I contacted, mm -hmm. uh, we have two weddings this weekend, and I contacted both of our couples to let them know that we'll be, you know, providing the photo booth services, but we'll, we'll be not providing the actual props for wow. help. So yeah, we're, everybody's feeling a little something. And with me being self-employed, you know, my wife and I, you know, we're most likely going to keep our daughter home on Monday if NISD doesn't, you know, pull the trigger on extending um, spring break. So yeah, we're feeling the effects of it as well. Well, thank you everyone for attending. Um, if anyone's got any feedback um, as to how the, how this worked, um, how this could be done better or, you know, Kudos to our speaker and everything else. Um, any feedback would be welcome, um, especially if we, we are to do this again next month. Um, so I do appreciate everything. Um, and I don't know if people want to continue talking on this or we should just uh, shut it down. I think we've got this for another a few minutes, right, Susan? Yeah, I don't know. Until 8, 8.30. I might shut off the recording just to keep it smaller. Yeah. No, okay, yeah. Um, Bob, what is the uh, name of that podcast again, man? There you go. Look, <laughs> having new eyes, having, having new, new having new pirate eyes. Okay, might be reversed on the on the video. But. <laughs>